right around Australia, welcome to Chris Conroy's World of Boats. Hi, welcome aboard. We have a departure from our normal format this week to bring you something that really is interesting, in fact, even fascinating. During our coverage of the 1985 Tim the Brim fishing competition, which was sponsored by Ampol, Johnson and Stessel, I mentioned that the same competition, the Tim the Brim fishing competition, had been held back in 1958 and we showed you some film involving one of Australia's greatest radio personalities, Jack Davey, which was shot of that 1958 competition. Now the film had been lost for years and years and years, it's out of the Ampol Film Library, somebody had borrowed it and failed to give it back and it popped up quite recently. Now it was in remarkably good condition considering its age. We've had it treated to remove most of the scratches and you'll find that the quality really is excellent but even if it was twice as bad the historically interesting aspects of it would make it worthwhile watching. Now I had the privilege of spending some time with Jack Davey in the around about 1957-58. My father actually was engineer on his big cruiser Sirocco and I went to sea for the first time in my life on Sirocco with Jack Davey so I had a chance to know the man. He really was a fascinating personality. This picture was shot, was produced not long before Jack Davey died so it's interesting. It's, I suspect actually that it's the last piece of film that he was ever on before he died. Now watch it. As far as the historical aspects of it are concerned, you should have a look at the old cars, which in those days were brand spanking new. Have a look at the boats. No fiberglass in those days. They were plywood, moulded ply, or carvel plank, but all made of timber. And particularly, have a look at the seagull outboard motors, which looked exactly the same then as they do now. Now, it's a fascinating film. I want you to watch it very closely. And remarkably, it parallels the, the adventures of the 1985 competition in that it rained and nobody caught Tim the Brim. Now, this is the 1958 Tim the Brim fishing competition at Yamba with Jack Davey. Going down Gamba, hell the full of moon. I'm gonna try my luck there with the anglers of the best at the Ampal National Fishing Contest. I've travelled o'er Australia, north, south, east and west. I've been so many places, I don't know which is best. I've always had a yearning and now I'll get my wish to go down there to Amber and try to catch a fish. Yamba, in northern New South Wales, where the waters of the mighty Clarence River meet and mingle within the portals of a man-made harbour with the league-long rollers of the vast Pacific. In June, this wide-bordered estuary becomes probably Australia's greatest fishing ground for brim because these tasty fish swarm in their thousands from miles upstream to spawn in the rough water where the river meets the sea. It was at Yamba in June that Ampol Petroleum Limited staged the world's greatest and most novel fishing contest. Prize money of 14,000 pounds. 1,000 pounds for anyone who caught Tim, a river brim wearing a metal tag as a badge of his worth. Normally, Yamba in June is a sunny, sleepy hamlet of 750 people. But thousands of anglers and would-be anglers from all over Australia crowded into the little town for the first division of the two big fishing contests which preceded the mass hunt for Tim. A fierce winter cyclone brought rain and leaden skies. But these didn't damper the ardour of the anglers or stop the fish from biting. 
for 20 hours, all through a wind and rain swept afternoon and an even wilder night. Hundreds of anglers huddled in small boats fished upon the sheltered waters of the estuary. Others, more hardy, perched precariously on rocky breakwaters built half a century ago to shape and channel the river mouth for use as a deep sea port. And on headlands outside where the wind blew hardest and one false step could have meant disaster, fearless rock hoppers made their long casts and when luck guided their lines, pulled in king size tailor and jewfish. In a contest of contrasts, all were triers. All with the time-proven wisdom of anglers were patient. Some caught two pounders. Others brought 20 pounders to the weigh-in. Terry Jones caught the biggest of all, a 45 and a half pound jewfish. The honor of catching most fish inside the estuary went to an unassuming postal clerk named Ron Bailey, who also happens to be Australian amateur angling champion. In 20 hours, he landed 133 brim, a catch which won him more than 300 pounds. Altogether, in the first division of the contests, the anglers caught 1,377 pounds of fish. Generously, they donated most of them to be auctioned for legacy. It was my pleasure to be there to lend a hand, or rather a voice, with the auction. Of course, the anglers kept some for themselves. Champion axeman Clive McIntosh, for example, did a practice 12-inch standing chop on a jewfish. And these little fellas finished where they belong. Mmm, <laughs> you can almost smell them. Cyclone lashed Jamba with a fury that made organized fishing impossible. But it didn't stop the anglers from preparing to fish, from indulging in that rare old pastime beloved to all brim fishermen, gathering yabbies for bait. did it prevent an even bigger lineup for the second division of the fishing contests. <laughs> Notice the tight-lipped young man in the sou'wester. He's John Garvin, Yamba's champion catcher of big jewfish. Bailey, in his army hat, was relaxed as he waited for the siren to send the anglers on their way. Garvin takes off like a Herb Elliott, and so does Bailey, as the starters break up to make a beeline for pre-selected fishing positions. Bailey legs it out to his boat. Garvin catches a crab as he hightails it towards a headland. <laughs> Bailey's on his way. So is Garvin, but with mountainous seas pounding in, he holds little hope that the Jewfish will be biting. Bailey, meantime, has reached the wave-swept claim he has staked out on the estuary breakwater. Garvin retreats before the anger of a rising sea. Bailey and his mates Ron Cron and Len Thompson are in action less than 15 minutes after the contest starts.
Norman fishes on regardless, but the experience of years of rock fishing tells him he's wasting his time. As the afternoon draws on, the setting sun silhouettes three iron men, impervious to sea and wind and rain, as Bailey, Cronk and Thompson settle down on their craggy catwalk to fish all night. They were still there with the rise of the sun, chilled to the bone but carrying on pulling in brim, despite the need occasionally of throwing back the little ones. Bailey, who says his fishing line is so sensitive that through it he can hear the brim whispering together, reels in one that's undersized. Nonchalantly, he throws it back and almost in the same motion reaches for another yabby. Cronk fishing in the background lands a beauty. Bailey, a tireless, nerveless human machine who loves fishing but rarely eats fish, shows no sign of strain. But Cronk's strong face reflects the night-long effort. For him, soon after daybreak, he said even the rocks he was standing on began to move. Daybreak also found a persistent John Garvin still matching his skill and his luck against an unkindly sea. He fished all night without as much as a bite. But look at Bailey. Even his hat's got a brim on it. He caught another 73 brim, just enough when added to his previous catch to win him 100 pounds for the most fish caught in the two nights. Ron Cronk had a better second night. He landed 97 brim. Thompson got 80, a total of 250 fish caught within a radius of 20 yards. Roy Davis won 100 pounds by catching 124 brim weighing 246 pounds. He lives at Yamba. He also won a fortnight's holiday at Yamba. Gordon Jarrett on the left had to get a mate to help him carry in his 161 pound catch, which won him first prize of more than 300 pounds in the rock and beach contest. Once again, Bailey and the other champions and anglers right down the line, down to people who caught just one or two fish, donated their catches to be auctioned for legacy. While the auction was underway, a much more serious transaction was taking place in the Bank of New South Wales in the nearby town of McLean, as the contest organizer, Terry Southwell Keeley, deposited with the bank 50 small metal tags and 50 photographs of the tags. One of the tags next day was to adorn Tim the Brim. Bank manager Eggins took no chances. One of those tags could be worth 10,000 pounds. He made doubly sure they were safe. He put them in a safe within a safe. There they stayed until he got them out for the big event next day. So the great day dawned. But the westerly knew what was in the wind, that Tim was in danger. It ruffled the waves with its chill breath of caution. They in turn passed the warning on to every fish in the estuary. In other words, it was a lousy day for fishing. But thousands were already here, and thousands more were soon to join them, all hoping to leave 10,000 pounds richer. I've got my gear already, my rod and reel and line. My car's filled up with ample, so I'll be there on time. Now I must be going, cause I'll be busy soon After Tim the Brim at Yamber on a sunny day in June 
the bigot and Daddy Amber on that sunny day in June. The hunt for Tim the Tag Brim, 10,000 was the tune. Our famous old Ned Kelly turned or in his grave. 2,000 pounds for old Ned was all the troopers gave. The prize attracted thousands who jammed the roads for miles. All were out to try their luck against the fishers' wiles. They came with boats and baskets in twos and fours and fives. Some had to bring their children, some had to bring their wives. And as 17,000 people, all with dreams of landing Tim, crowded into Yamba, out on the bay, a team led by Mr. Theo Ruffley, Australia's leading authority on fish, was very busy. Under his supervision, 50 brim, which fishermen had netted overnight, were transferred to an aerated tank on the official launch, ready for tagging. 50 brim and 50 tags, one worth 10,000 pounds. With great care not to injure the fish, Mr. Ruffley attached the tags. Once they were secure, his assistant quickly restored each fish to the haven of the dark waters of Yamba Bay. Then Police Inspector Arthurson selected at random one photograph of a tag. He sealed it before anyone could see the number. What a lottery! The person who brought in a brim wearing the corresponding tag would win 10,000 pounds. As Tim Tension mounted in Yamba, late starters paid their entry fees. All entries, of course, went to Legacy, which received over 2,500 pounds as a result of the Ampol contest. came the Grand Parade. I volunteered to lead the march. Right behind those marching girls, I had one of the finest views in Yamba. As starting time drew near, thousands of eager, impatient anglers all out to catch one little fish lined up to hear Theo Ruffley tell them where he'd let the tag brim go and to show them where, if they were lucky, they'd find the tag. And so the biggest fish hunt in the world got underway, something Isaac Walton never dreamed about when he wrote The Complete Angler. Soon, 600 boats of all shapes and sizes were jockeying for positions on the choppy waters of Yamba Bay. They were one-man boats, one-and-a-half-man boats, two-man boats, three-man, well, at least two-and-a-half-man boats. or maybe three men in a joker boats. They were boats that came three at a time. Those who couldn't afford a boat borrowed a floating crane. There were girls, God bless them, who feast under arm. Girls who feast over arm. Girls who got their feet wet. Girls who kept their feet dry. For some, like this mother out with dad and the kids, they were brim, but none with tags on. There were those not interested in comfort, and those who were. There were people with fishing lines everywhere, big people and little people, on the water, on the shore, thousands of people, 
all after one little fish. So the great day drew to its close. The multitude, who'd come with such high hopes, stuck doggedly at their self-imposed task, although their hopes dwindled as the sun dropped lower in the wintry sky. Tim, low tagged, emerged triumphant. A fish of gold who'd resisted the lure of thousands of dangling lines. The fish above all other fish, which really got away. Anybody sees one of these pelicans going into any branch of the Bank of New South Wales, don't be rude to him. He could be a very wealthy bird. Tim evaded anglers who came from near and far. He swim up the river or out across the bar. Supper for a pelican, a dear shark get him. No one will ever know the fate of Tim the Brim. Well, there it is. I'm sure you enjoyed watching that as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you. Now, next week, we're going to have a look at a fishing competition of a different kind. During the last week, we've been on Fraser Island having a look at the Orchid Beach fishing competition up there. Now, it was sponsored by Forex and a few other people. A fascinating fishing competition. In fact, my arms won't spread wide enough to show you how big some of the fish that were caught were. And, of course, we have a look at Fraser Island, Orchid Beach, the Mahino, and all of the fascinating aspects of that magnif magnificent island as well. So be with us next week for another World of Baits on Fraser Island. That's about it for this week. I'll see you next week with another World of Baits. In the meantime, take care and safe baiting.